We have the nation's fourth highest incarceration rate, even though it's gone down. Um, we want those people who are dangerous to the public to be in prison, but we know that you know two thirds of the people entering Texas prisons are nonviolent. We've got you know 20,000 offenders in our state prisons for drug possession, um, low-level drug possession, not drug dealing. So we've got a lot of nonviolent people who could you know potentially be in a drug court and some type of other program to hold them accountable uh, and protect public safety that would be less costly to taxpayers. You know, we think there is uh, an opportunity to realize savings by, you know, closing prisons um, and in taking some of those savings and putting it into alternatives that will uh, do more to reduce crime with every dollar that we spend. I think we certainly need to uh, move forward next session with looking at our sentencing laws, looking at our um, uh, looking at uh, like we've done on the juvenile side with the commitment reduction program creating an incentive plan uh, where counties uh, DA's uh, could agree to send fewer nonviolent people to prison uh, target a lower commitment for the coming biennium uh, voluntarily and then in return from the state they would get um, some of the avoided costs uh, that they could use for There's uh, more than 1,700 criminal laws in Texas. There's actually 11 felonies relating to harvesting oysters uh, alone. So most of these laws are not in the penal code. They're in the scattered throughout the other codes dealing with ordinary business activities. And, and obviously those types of laws don't account for most of our, our, our prison population. But still, I think they, they undermine freedom. They deter you know, productive activity. For a host of reasons, we, we need to, uh, first of all, before we criminalize anything else, we need to make sure, is this already a crime? Uh, we're just criminalizing things five or ten times over. Uh, and then on these enhancements, one of my concerns is in the past we've seen these bills and every session there's about 40 new crimes created, you know, 30 or 40 new enhancements uh, every session. I hope that number is much less this session. But one of the things that we need is accurate fiscal notes. We've got to draw the line and be clear about what should be criminal and what should be civil and what should be left to the private sector, the market, to, to regulate when it comes to business activity. Yes, I think it's a uh, worthwhile uh, approach. I think it probably doesn't go for far enough. You know, a couple of the ideas we have are, you know, first of all, and I think this has been done in Oregon, but a dashboard um, that would not only show the cost, but also what the uh, correctional outcomes, what the public safety outcome, what the outcome for victims is in terms of restitution of different options whether it's a drug court or probation or a particular type of treatment program, uh, electronic monitoring, a whole range of options that, that the court would have. One of the issues now is simply that because there's fewer use at TYC, there's about 2,000, whereas there were 5,000 in 2006, the per youth cost has gone up because some of the costs are fixed costs. So we're now, the most recent legislative budget board estimate was in 08, which was $271 uh, per youth per day. But now, from what I understand, we're, it's probably around $320 uh, per youth per day. Be partly because of the population shrinking. TYC did a uh, pretty good job in terms of their uh, legislative appropriations request. They were candid about um, that they would basically, to meet their 10%, the main thing, a 10% reduction, the main thing they would do would be to close two facilities, consolidate those use into other facilities. That's two additional beyond the ones that are already uh, have been or are slated to be closed. One of the concerns among you know advocates and a concern that we share is we don't want to do anything that's going to result in more juveniles you know, in the adult uh, prison system or even adult probation for that matter. I think that you know there's a reason we have a juvenile justice system. It, it, juveniles have different needs um, and the research is quite clear that when you take you know a 16 or 15 year old and put them in with hardened adult criminals in an adult prison, the recidivism rates are just uh, sky high. So even though you may save some money on the front end in terms of adult prisons being cheaper, um, you end up really uh, having a lot of cost both to victims and uh, to taxpayers with you know a youth being a chronic criminal for so many for decades to come. There really is potentially an opportunity to to uh, uh, really maybe just have several state facilities for, for those youth that have committed the very most serious offenses your determined sentence use and then uh, you know get have the other youths with appropriate funds going with them go back to to the counties uh, through the juvenile probation system. You face a very difficult situation when you're looking at you know, the TDCJ budget, 85% of that budget is for prisons, um, but 
two to three times as many offenders are on probation and parole as are in prison. I think overall what we're going to uh, need is to, is to have policymakers realize that, um, you know, prisons aren't Prisons are absolutely necessary. There's uh, the violent, the sex offenders, the people we know we need to be protected from. That 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 the just putting them behind bars is is the way to do that. But but to realize that um, you know, especially now with this budget crisis, you have to make sure that you know you get the greatest return for every dollar you spend.